Formula One is a sport in which pushing the limits of technology and design is part of its very DNA. It's set apart from a lot of other single-seater motorsports by allowing teams to come up with their own solutions to the limits of the regulations, in an attempt to create the fastest cars on the grid, and often, the world. But allowing endless innovation isn't a win-win situation, and those that run the sport often have to push back against breakthroughs and inspiration by adjusting or flat-out rewriting the rules. This becomes a point of annoyance for many fans, but rules aren't changed without reason. Though it is fair to say that not every adjustment to the rules is the best possible choice that has the most desired outcome. Because it's hard. So how do we keep F1 the pinnacle of technology, rewarding envelope-pushing technology and design, while simultaneously managing the problems of trailblazing R&D like out-of-control costs, muted racing and unacceptable safety risks? The answer is a lot trickier than it seems at first thought, and while a lot of people may shout, just let engineers loose and let them make the best possible cars, or even stop this ludicrously overcomplicated technology and pair everything back to the good old days of racing, there's very good reasons why both of these avenues of thought lead to problems. While the formula part of Formula One technically represents the rules and regulations that all cars must adhere to, it goes deeper than that. Formula One as a concept represents values, visions and character. It wants to be the motorsport that drives technological innovation, produces some of the fastest cars in the world, sets a platform for the best drivers to go head to head, and provides world class entertainment that millions will flock to see. A few weeks ago, Porsche modified its old sports car beyond the rules of the series it competed in, and in doing so the car was able to beat the lap record at Spa-Francorchamps previously held by a regulated Formula 1 car. And a couple of weeks ago, Formula 1 voted in new rules that would both simplify some of its aerodynamics, probably to the effect of making the car slower, while increasing the effectiveness of its DRS, a more artificial means of promoting overtaking. So it's these kind of things that start getting the F1 community frustrated. Why are we hampering technology when we can literally see what's possible if you let engineers run free? Well let's start with the limitations. Here's one obvious limit. With the knowledge we have, we could probably make cars that are too fast for humans to drive. With the right tyres, aero and mechanical magic, cars could be made that would corner so fast that humans may pass out from the forces. Even if we gave drivers G-suits, which seems a bit ludicrous but okay, even then the cars would become unsuitable for a lot of the circuits they race on. Faster cars need much more and better designed runoff areas and better barrier technology than a lot of circuits currently have or are capable of. Goodbye Monaco and Singapore immediately. Goodbye Spa and Monza too probably. Even if we discount driver safety we still have to account for marshals and spectators. Another limit is expense. The big budget manufacturer teams can push the envelope much further and in many more directions than the lower budget privateer teams. Unconstrained innovation would put the smaller teams at risk of being laughably uncompetitive. And while one might say if they can't keep up they shouldn't be there, you also need a healthy number of teams for the sport to actually be a sport. For competition and fun to exist. More on costs a bit later. We also have the technology to automate a lot of what the driver does. We saw the very beginnings of this when launch control and traction control were allowed in F1, but if you were really allowed to go wild, the computer could aid with steering, braking, constantly changing engine modes to the optimal setting, changing movable aero parts along the car, etc etc. Right now we control for this by having a standardised ECU. A development constraint that I think we all agree is for the best, as the drivers should get maximum control over their car. So now we hopefully agree that there are obvious limits to allowing free unconstrained development, let's look at what happens in the real world. Let's look at technological evolution. F1 rule sets are drawn up with the best of intentions, and I know some of you may disagree with me, but let's go along with the benefit of the doubt and say F1 rule sets are drawn up with the best of intention. Let's simplify this right down and say F1 wants to maintain its core identity by maximising certain criteria. Speed, the ability to innovate, style and entertainment which comes in the form of good racing. While F1 attempts to maximise these parts of the sport, it has to do so while maintaining safety and costs and accessibility, which can be directly affected by out of control innovation. Now when you create a rule set, you can only do it with the knowledge you currently have about the sport and its technology. But as technology grows with brand new research and development, the design of the cars can start to push the whole sport away from the values you tried to foster with your rule set. Just as the giraffe grew a ridiculously long neck in the game of which horse can get the most leaves, F1 cars will start diverging away from their year one interpretation of the rules, as loopholes are found, as new engineering solutions are discovered, and as research discovers brand new directions in development to explore. Teams will find solutions and ideas that the rulemakers never even imagined. Just like in the film Airbud, where a dog was allowed on the basketball team because no one had thought to include the rule humans only. Airbud.
Now back in the middle period of F1's life, unconstrained innovation led to really interesting solutions that are relevant today, like wings, side pod cooling, carbon fibre, full body aerodynamics. They also led to weirder things like six wheeled cars, ludicrous wings, controllable ride height, mid wings and winglets from hell. Some people really liked the weirder outcomes of technological competition, some people hated them for their ungainliness. In terms of keeping F1 stylish and sexy, some of the more absurd bits of bodywork have been given the ban purely on aesthetic grounds. But why else would you want to curb innovation? One reason often cited is safety. Now we're getting slightly mixed messages on this one I agree. 2017 saw a raft of new rule changes brought in to make the cars notably faster. But that blip aside, the FIA does tend to move in every time it sees F1 cars getting too fast. This is a bugbear for people, but there are obviously quite reasonable safety concerns not to allow the cars to get too fast. One, as stated earlier, is the circuits themselves have limits on what they can handle. I'll be doing a full dive into runoff areas soon, but believe me when I say that the Hungara ring isn't going to be able to protect an out of control Bloodhound supersonic car. But here are the questions that the FIA has to ask when the car's speeds start to ramp up. What happens if the car fails mid-corner? What happens if the brakes fail or the accelerator gets stuck open? What happens if a car t-bones another car at full speed? Can it take off? What happens if it takes off? If the answer to any of those questions are, it could lead to serious injury, then the FIA has to bring it all back a bit to protect drivers, track staff and spectators. That's its job. Another reason to curb innovation is costs. Now it's easy to go all capitalist free market on this and say, let the teams decide what they want to spend to be the best, but this gets out of hand very quickly. Let's imagine that for some reason huge gains were made in overall suspension performance by adding a little wiggle to their arms. Once this is discovered, teams start researching and developing in this area. They spend some money and gain some performance in their first year. The second year they spend more money and gain a bit more performance. The next year they're spending more money to gain a fraction more performance. Each year they keep throwing money at the problem, because they can, but the gains in return are minuscule. This is a case where diminishing returns are being brought in for escalating costs. It would probably be reasonable in this case to stop teams throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars or more at refining some good technology to a ridiculous degree. And this is when you sort of say suspension has to be a certain shape or within certain parameters. The innovation at this point has been made. This is just refinement to an absurd level. And it's just not fun, interesting or sporting for the massive big budget teams to be able to make enough expensive but tiny refinements to their cars to outclass the other teams. And then we come to the racing. The best example here is one of the biggest problems that the technical working group is still trying to solve after over a decade of headaches, the dirty air problem. Now I've gone through this before, but essentially the complicated aerodynamics of the modern F1 car can create a storm of chaotic air behind the cars, such that a chasing car struggles to get close and therefore can't actually race wheel to wheel on a regular basis, even if the drivers and cars are faster and more skilled than the cars ahead. This is a problem where the increased innovation in aerodynamics has directly led to the detriment of actual racing. And it's an invisible problem, so people don't see that there's a direct connection between the fancy schmancy bodywork here and processional racing. The front wing complexities, turning vanes and cutouts down the body of the car basically create an invisible force field that are holding chasing cars at a distance. I mean that's an analogy, but only just. If we could see it, we'd be happy to ban it. If the cars dragged a fan of spikes behind them so it was super difficult for the car behind to get close, the fans would say, get rid of the spike fan, I don't care how innovative it is, it sucks. But that analogy fails because you can remove the spike fan independently of the rest of the car. Dirty air, that's a different story. See, dirty air is the byproduct of knowledge. We have learned a lot about manipulating airflow over the decades to the point where we're making tiny variations in wing and body contours to shape, energise and direct air exactly how we need it to. At first aerodynamics was mainly about downforce, but as we've learned in earlier videos we're now creating vortices, we're energising specific layers of air, we're channelling air to particular areas etc etc. We know what we want air to do and we know how to do it. It's not a genie we can put back in the bottle. While the spike fans I hypothesised about are not a byproduct of some other technology and can easily be removed independently, dirty air is absolutely intrinsic to everything aerodynamicists are trying to do. They don't want to create a big trail of dirty air behind the cars, but that's just what happens when you supercharge a load of vortices and send them off down the bodywork. People can't unlearn the need to work air in that way. It's too advantageous. This is a big part of the reason why we haven't really solved the problem in many, many years of knowing about it and why our best solution is to slap a DRS on the wing to help alleviate some of the problems. So where do we go from here? 
Well, we often look at other series like IndyCar and Formula 2 and say, wow, the racing is so great. Why can't Formula 1 be like that? And a big part of the reason is that these are spec series where everyone basically has the same chassis and very little technical variation. You can easily remove problems by designing all the cars to be identically problem free. Don't like winglets? Give everyone a winglet free car. Don't like dirty air? Design cars that produce minimally invasive wakes. It's simple when you can control the exact design of all the cars. Formula 1 though, that's not in its nature. It wants to be a breeding ground for cutting edge design, but is always chasing the bad side effects that come with it. Like rapid development of the internet brought us all together with social media and interactive content, hooray! But this also gave rise to hordes of horrible internet trolls and abusers. And now we're not sure how to keep the good bits of the internet and get rid of the problems of trolls at the same time. We can't undo the internet and we can't undo aerodynamics. So that's why we have a lot of very strange, very precise rules dictating the exact shape in which the bodywork can and can't exist. Exact weights and balances for parts of the car, exact stress tests, limits on what materials can be used and how they can be used. It's all in aim of trying to thread designers through tighter and tighter needles in the hopes that they can stop producing effects that are bad for F1. We saw it in recent years with car noses where the FIA tried to bring nose heights down so that drivers didn't get smacked in the head in the T-bone accident. But designers wanted high noses, so they did the bare minimum to comply with the rules and made the most hideous cars possible. So the FIA had to sigh like beleaguered parents of teenagers and give them very specific instructions over how the noses could be shaped. And now they all pretty much look the same apart from the tips. Here's one thought. With dirty air, maybe we can measure effect. Maybe there's a wind tunnel test they can perform where they measure the disturbance of the air behind the car. I don't know how possible that is, but I think it would be better to make a mandate on the effect than try and write rules that constrain how designers approach their car in the hope that the bad effect goes away. I mean, that's how crash tests work to an extent. The FA doesn't care what solution you come up with to pass the crash test. You just need to pass it so they know your car provides a safe monocoque in the event of an accident. The same with wing flexibility. The FA don't want the wings to flex too much, so they literally just test the flexibility instead of trying to mandate a wing design that probably won't flex. Again, it's a complicated field and trying to create technical regulations that are effective and lasting is a very hard job, which is why the 2021 rules are years and years in the making. And that's why we sometimes get band-aid solutions like the DRS or the Halo, while we figure out how to craft the rules in a way that allow technology to thrive, but keeps the spirit of F1 alive.